Okay, here we go. Okay, well, we have a good one for you tonight. Hello and welcome to the Sports Affinity Webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, FJMC, the parent organization of over 250 conservative men's clubs, members around the world, brings value and adds meaning to the lives of men and their families. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mando. We are co-chairs of Sports Affinity. We'll be hosting tonight. We'll mute everyone so we can enjoy the presenter's remarks so and we, we can take questions. It will be now my pleasure to introduce Mike Berman, NBC TV5, Chicago sports reporter and anchor. Since the day he wanted to be a sports journalist, Mike Berman's dream was to work in his hometown. That dream became reality in August of 2016 when he joined the NBC TV team as a sports reporter and anchor. Mike is thrilled to be covering all the Chicago area teams he grew up, grew up cheering for. Before returning home, Mike worked for almost two years as the main sports anchor at WTTV, CBS, in Indianapolis. Prior to his time there, he spent more than six years as a sports anchor reporter at Times Warner Cable News in Austin, Texas. Mike began his career in Springfield, Illinois, Illinois where he served as a sports anchor reporter at WCIS, ABC for two years. Working in sports journalism has enabled Mike to witness some of the biggest sporting events in the United States. He's covered the Super Bowl, World Series, NBA Finals, Indy 500, Men's and Women's Final Four, College World Series, and many bowl games. Mike has a degree in broadcast news from the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri. While attending school, he worked at KOMU NBC as a sports anchor, reporter, producer, and lent his voice as a PA announcer. When he's not working, Mike likes to fish, play basketball, golf, spend time with friends and family. It is now my pleasure to have him introduce Mike Berman, who will take it away from here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the introduction. And sometimes we, we all need reminders about um, things to be grateful for. So it's nice to listen to you, David, recite my bio and be reminded of all the great things I've gotten to do and that I set out with a very challenging goal to work in my hometown, which is, you know, Chicago is the third biggest media market in the country. And it's a it's such a challenging industry. Um, you know, there's so many things that are out of your control. Um, a lot of times, you know, stations are looking for different elements of diversity with their on-air staff to reflect all the the people who are uh, in the viewing public watching. And, uh, you know, at times a contract that, you know, when you work at a TV station on the air, you have a contract. And so if your contract doesn't line up, the end of it doesn't line up with an opening at a, at a different station in a bigger market that you want to get to, then that kind of takes that move out of the mix. So bottom line is, you know, I really did go to Missouri hoping to learn about journalism and hoping to then travel a road that would get me where I ultimately am. So um, it's, it's nice to hear that bio read. It's nice to be reminded that um, I accomplished something that's not easy. And I've gotten to have a lot of fun along the way. Um, man, hearing about some of those events takes me back. I think of, um, you know, I think of covering Super Bowls and Indy 500s and NBA finals and bowl games and, and all that stuff that, you know, I grew up watching all that stuff that all of us sports fans sit and watch uh, every year. And, you know, some of the biggest moments that define our fan fanhood happen in games like that and events like that. And so to have been in some of those, you know, uh, watching them live and then in the locker room, reporting on it afterwards is it, it's, it's really a dream come true. So um, I'd love to tell you about my journey here, even though you, Dave, even though you uh, read it, you know, I think it's, it's nice to give some context to it, uh, to tell you about some of the specifics about each job. And, you know, I, I'd love to talk some Chicago sports because that's my specialty. And I'd love to leave plenty of time for questions because when I've done these, I did it once or twice, did one with um, 
um, men's groups across the country. And I have to say, there were some very interesting, funny, goofy questions. So uh, my expectations are high for what we're going to get later, gang. So you better deliver. Um, and by the way, Dave, I should add from my bio, because you didn't mention it, you said your two dogs are Fenway and Brady, right? Yes, Fenway so, and Brady. Yes, yes, Mike. Fenway and so, Brady. So that my is that is evidence of your depth of being a fan. Well, our uh, chocolate brown Labradoodle is Stanley in honor of the Stanley Cup, because uh, when Stanley was born, it was 2014. So that was the Hawks were right in their run there of, of three cups in about half a decade. So I'm right there with you. I'm a big sports fan now. Uh, and I'll hit this because I think it's an interesting element. Doing what I do has definitely changed the way I'm a sports fan. Um, I'll leave that for a little bit later. But I'll tell you about my journey. I grew up in the north suburbs of Chicago. And I loved it. Was so fortunate that my dad shared uh, Bulls tickets. So, you know, I was there to watch you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls. Um, I don't care if there's any LeBron supporters out there. I will not hear any arguments that MJ is not the greatest of all time. So I was there in 92 and 97 when they clinched at home, which was super fun. And, you know, grew up going to Cubs games too and Bears games. My dad was a huge Cubs fan, so he passed that down to me. I uh, loved the Bulls. That was like that was like life as a child was like every Bulls game you were dialed in after school. And then the next day you were talking about it at school. And I would sit there in the morning at the kitchen table and I would pour over the box scores like I'm sure all of you watching did. And I I knew, you know, who was the lead leader in points per game or batting average and stuff like that. It, that was just like ingrained in my memory. And I loved playing sports, too. You know, I played baseball and basketball and golf growing up. Uh, I, play, I played basketball and golf all the way through varsity in high school. And um, you know, I think once I was in high school, I was uh, I took an elective class that was a broadcasting class. And how lucky were we that at my high school, Glenbrook North High School in Northbrook in the north suburbs of Chicago, they had like a TV studio and, and a couple teachers that taught um, everything from using a camera to editing to then presenting it in a studio and reading off of a teleprompter. Um, so we learned um, everything. We learned a little bit about everything that goes into doing television. And I think it kind of, you know, it, really sparked my interest and lit a fire and I really enjoyed it and I decided I was gonna go to college to study journalism and uh, so looked at two different schools closely Syracuse and Missouri I think I went to Syracuse it was the middle of winter there was about 500 feet of snow and I was like I don't know about this and then visited Missouri, and there was a guy down my street who was in the A.E. Pie house there. Uh, went and spent the weekend alone hanging with them. That was a little more fun. So I uh, decided to go to Missouri, which has a fantastic journalism school, and feel like it was a great decision. I had a great time there, and most importantly, learned so much. And as I was kind of getting towards the end of my time there, even though at the beginning of my time, I explored that. Do I maybe want to do writing or maybe want to do, I thought maybe I wanted to be like a baseball beat writer. Um, so I tried doing some school newspaper stuff, which wasn't too bad, but then I did an internship at a newspaper after my freshman year of college. I really, I just didn't love it. So I focused more on the uh, TV stuff. However, I, I made a slight detour halfway through when I was declaring for the journalism school, you had to declare which kind of track you were going to be on. Was it going to be a print, magazine, a TV broadcast, 
or advertising. And I don't know why. Maybe I was just rebelling. And uh, I chose advertising in that moment, which after a year I decided was a bad choice. I then declared back to TV. But ultimately, one of the great decisions of my life, because it required me to stay an entire extra year at Mizzou. So I got to go to college for five years. And it wasn't because I mean, I am pretty stupid, but it wasn't directly because I was stupid. Um, so, you know, maybe my parents have a bone to pick with me about that because i um, fortunate enough that they were paying for college. But when I finally got my head screwed on right and decided I wanted to do broadcast, you know, I was really making um, sacrifices. Um, even in, in college, I remember, you know, I would the first anchor shift I did, which was for like eight weeks straight, was Friday morning. So that meant I couldn't go out with my friends on Thursday nights and Thursday, you know, in college. Oh, it's such a big night. You got to go out. It's the start of the weekend. But that was a good introduction to the sacrifices that are required of being in this industry, because ultimately, whether it's, you know, having having to travel um, a road that pops you around to different places in the country, live in a small place you'd never choose to live, um, whether it's working weekends, holidays, off hours, there's lots of sacrifices. So that was a good introduction to it. And, and really, it's such an amazing program there at Missouri that, you know, I was covering I went and covered, I remember the first game at the new Bush Stadium in St. Louis. So that was something that was really neat. And I covered a Chiefs game in Kansas City. And, you know, within Missouri, within uh, Columbia, I was covering all the Mizzou football and basketball games. So great experience. It was, as I always say, as close to the real thing as you can get without being out of school. And I really set a hard goal for myself. I wanted to get to Chicago. And a lot of people, especially when I was growing up, you know, ESPN and Sports Center was so big. You know, before, like now, you can you can watch virtually any game, and you know what has happened in any game immediately because you could watch the highlights, you can hear the biggest sound bites. So, but back then you had to go to Sports Center for that. So a lot of people who I was in school with wanted to work on Sports Center or work at ESPN or work in LA or Fox, whatever. I wanted to work in Chicago. You know, there's only a finite amount of TV stations there, only a finite amount of jobs in sports at each station. So I knew it was going to be a challenge and it was really hard along the way. It was hard when I went to Springfield, Illinois to start. Although all things considered, that was a good first job. Some of my other inter interviews were in Cheyenne, Wyoming and Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, those are some small markets I interviewed in, but I was fortunate enough to get a job in Springfield, which was three hours from home. It was also three hours from Columbia, Missouri, where I still had friends at Mizzou. So I got to be around some family and friends while I was working my first job. And that was a, that was a challenge because you are doing everything. I am so grateful that now, these days, I don't do anything except prepare my scripts and go on the air. But back then, I was doing everything. I was going out with the camera and shooting. I was coming back. I was editing everything together. I was building the rundown, which is where you put the stories and the graphics and write all the scripts. So... They call that being a one-man band or a multimedia journalist. And it's very challenging. And, you know, the compensation is my first job I made $23,000. So um, that's, you know, that's taking care of your rent and not much more. But it was fun. And I loved how, um, in addition to getting to do some things in Chicago and St. Louis that were bigger, it was really focused on local and there was a lot of high school sports, which in smaller towns, you know, they are really watching the, the local news to see all that high school coverage. So, you know, what you're doing is being watched and matters. Um, and it was easy for me at 23 years old to relate to 
the high school kids who were, you know, 17, 18 years old. So um, it, it, it was good in that regard. It was hard in that I moved to a small town that didn't have a lot of activity, you know, kind of everything kind of closed up early and didn't have a lot of friends when I got there. But, you know, in those small markets, you have a lot of people who are in the same boat where they are all in their first job with big dreams. So you're, you're friends with those people, you hang out with those people. And ultimately it was a great experience and I learned so much. I mean, I always think back to nothing could be worse than my first anchor shift on the job when the person running the teleprompter, they switch it to show you the weather graphics when you're the weather person. That's how they can point to the side and and it and they and they nail where they're trying to point. They forgot to switch it back to the teleprompter. I didn't know that. I thought they were just going to switch. It was just automatically going to switch. So anyways, the sports started and I was looking at myself and a weather map. I didn't know what was happening. So I bumbled through that. And thought I was going to get fired after one day. So I always, I always frame things when, uh, when a, a, a live shot or a show doesn't go well. I'm like, can't be as bad that, as that first day in Springfield. So I did two years there, there as the weekend sports anchor, and then I was off to Austin, Texas, and uh, that was really a step up because I started to cover things and on a level that would put me in position to get the kind of jobs that I really wanted. You know, we covered Texas Longhorns football like it was an NFL team. And it was the best. I traveled all all over the place. And <clears throat> my first year there in 08, they lost once and played, to, played for the Fiesta Bowl. The next year in 09, they won the national title at the Rose Bowl. So that was really cool. College baseball is a big deal there. I got to cover multiple College World Series. Um, I got to cover the San Antonio Spurs winning the uh, the title in, uh, I believe it was 2014, 13 or 14. My memory's failing me there a little bit. Um, but I was there six years, and I love it. was an amazing city. If you've been there, you know. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet my my wife there, who it turns out was from 15, 20 minutes away from me. Uh growing up here in, in the Chicago suburbs. And um, so Austin will always hold a special place in our hearts. And it was really the place where I started to understand what it meant to cover things that are big and on a bigger scale. And then I, I never would have gotten to Chicago if I didn't go to Indianapolis because it's such a dynamic sports market. It's, um, you know, the Colts are a big deal. The Pacers are a big deal. <clears throat> Indy 500 and IndyCar racing base there. Such a big deal. Um, hang on. Let me send this call to voicemail. I am busy. Um, and lots of um, lots of outside events. You know, the city bids on them. And uh, if you've ever gone to see a major event there in downtown Indianapolis, it's a very convenient setup with, Lucas Oil Stadium and uh, well, what's it called now? Bankers Life Fieldhouse is what it was when I was there where the Pacers play. Everything is near downtown and walkable. So lots of Big Ten championships there. Final Four was there while I was there. And, you know, traveling to cover Colts games, covering the Indy 500, being on the air for seven hours before the race. Um, all those things were invaluable. And I was the main sports anchor there. So I was anchoring five nights a week, and I was the face of the sports product. Um, all those things really put me in position to have an opportunity to come home. And, you know, it never happens exactly when you want to, but it did happen. And I'm, I'm just so fortunate to be even eight and a half years later, still here at NBC in Chicago. And, you know, here I was able to came just in time to see the Cubs win the World Series and be a part of covering that. Um, you know, I've covered the Bears very closely, which is good and bad, a lot more bad, especially this past Sunday, which is just still eating at me. Um, got to see the <laughs> Chicago Sky win uh, the WNBA title and do their parade. Um, 
and have just gotten to do a lot of a lot of things that young me would have been almost would not have believed that I got to do. So that's my story, how I got here. I can certainly pause at this point and answer any questions or Dave, if you want to lead me down a different road, please no. do. <laughs> I think I would like so we have uh, we have questions in the chat. Okay, let's do that, Danny. Okay, good. Yeah, take it, Danny. You have a comedian here who wants to know where your Yankee sweatshirt is on the call. Remember, my my Yankee sweatshirt's at home. I'm at work. I'm I'm anchoring tonight. Can't you guys see my nice makeup? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, so here here's a real question, Mike. You now apparently. Hold on. Mike, you're now apparently overseeing a one-person sports department at NBC5 in Chicago. Are there plans to hire additional sports talent locally? Yes. Yes. Currently, I'm the only one on full-time staff because of some staff recent staffing changes. But uh, yes, there is a, a search underway for um, for more people to join me. Uh, on the air in the sports department, which would be great because we need it. So um, many of us uh, were watching other NFL games and then it was on CBS and then um, the game ended and they went to the Chicago game before 60 minutes to fill the rest of the half an hour. And I bet you that the next question is related to that what I witnessed, which was pretty cool because I really didn't care, but um, I'm sure if I was a Chicago fan, I would probably still, like you said, still thinking about it. <laughs> like, did that really just happen? So yeah, that yeah, objectively, that was a pretty awesome moment. But uh, when it's your <laughs> when it's your team and you're covering it, and I've now had to talk about and replay that video a hundred times. Oof, oof. So the question is. How do you like Caleb Williams as the quarterback of the Bears? And how do you think he measures up to Jaden Daniels and Drake May? Oh, Drake May. Yeah. Oh, Drake May. Yeah. <laughs> well, Drake Drake May, we haven't seen a lot of yet. No, no, so, no. I would not, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't compare. But Jaden Daniels, that's a good question. Yeah. And <clears throat> you know how it is with with quarterbacks um and draft classes, they're eternally linked. Uh, we went through that here with the Bears taking Mitch Trubisky instead of Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes in 2017. Watson, it turns out, they uh, dodged a bullet. Mahomes, you know, who could have known he would end up being, you know, prob probably on the Mount Rushmore of best <laughs> quarterbacks of all time. Um, so... Uh, yeah, we went through that and then, you know, Justin Fields in 2020, uh, but any, so they're always, they're always linked. I think that, um, I think Caleb Williams was the ultimate no brainer. Um, is he a little on the shorter side? Yes. Be nice if he had another inch or two, but I think he is really special. Um, you know, I think that there are inevitable ups and downs for a rookie quarterback no matter what and i know this has gotten a lot of publicity but how how true and how worth pointing out that peyton manning led the nfl in interceptions as a rookie um it's just it's it's such a hard transition even when you are you know the best uh, at the college level, you know, just the speed of the game and the, 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 the difficulty that, that it is in diagnosing defenses. When you break that huddle, diagnosing a defense pre-snap and post-snap in, in those split seconds. And, um, the, you know, again, the speed of the defenses. Um, and, and then also you're doing it you're you are it is a job and you are doing it as a pro and you are held to a different standard and placed under a, a different kind of microscope than you are in college i mean you're going to get a handful of guys who maybe in college 
were under that kind of microscope because of the program that they played in. But ultimately, you're never going to get what you're going to get in a Chicago or a New York or a Philadelphia at the college level. So I just think all of that coming together makes it really hard for there to be like linear success. So Caleb Early was bad. And then he was spectacular for three games. And then coming off the bye, the Bears in general weren't very good. Um, But at the same time, you know, how is the narrative changed if the Bears just knock that Hail Mary to the ground? Because if if that happens, Caleb Williams had led them (laughs) on a game-winning drive in the fourth quarter. So that changes the narrative. No, he didn't play great, but he found a way in the fourth quarter when it matters most. And we always see those stats about quarterbacks, you know, comeback wins. What's their record when they're down in the fourth quarter? Stuff like that. Uh, So he would have had one in the plus column for him. So I think he's a guy who can make every throw. I think he's um, got terrific athletic ability. Not to rip off the kind of 60-yard um, escape and touchdown runs that Justin Fields could, but to get out of trouble and to make a play. He's got that. And he's we've seen the progress he's made in reading defenses, looking off, you know, safeties to, to get to throw the other way and have someone open. I think he's going to be terrific. Um, Jane Daniels himself is terrific. I think – He's even more capable of making plays with his feet, uh, scrambling and picking up yards. He's got a great arm, um, and he's been really good. But, uh, you know, again, it's not linear. I wouldn't be surprised if if there was a patch this year where he has a game or multiple games where he struggles or he throws three picks. It's just – it's almost inevitable. So – um, that was a fun game to talk about last week because there was serious hype between it. The number one and number two picks, both of whom had been playing great, going up against each other. Uh, we got to see it, and we got an ending that uh, kind of fulfilled the hype. <laughs> so speaking of college sports, uh, you have a question here about them being paid. <laughs> the NIL. And where is this taking us in college sports? Where does this end up? <laughs> I don't know. There you are. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. I mean, right now, I think the biggest thing we're, that we're waiting on is legislation to be passed where there's a revenue sharing model between the colleges, which are getting the, that big money from TV deals and the players. And the proposal was that like the power conference teams would each be getting somewhere like 23, $24 million a year to use at their discretion. Um, so I think that might level the playing field a little more than it's not like there's some teams that can, because they've got really dedicated boosters willing to spend can, you know, go out and buy players as compared to other schools that, I don't know, they can't raise those NIL dollars. I think ultimately there needed to be change. Um, It's, it's just not fair to sit there and say, you know, well, these athletes get a free education. Okay. Well, you know, that's true, but also they are putting their lives on the line for the millions and millions of dollars that these schools get because of what they do. And that's through that, that's TV deal stuff. That's merchandise stuff. You know, I mean, the ultimate one that they always talked about is, you know, walking into the bookstore buying the jersey of the guy on the team and the guy on the team isn't sharing in any of the profit. I mean, you know, that's just, that's just counterintuitive in my opinion. So I'm a, I am totally a fan of NIL. 
but I do think it needs to be legislated. And I think that that's kind of been the problem. Often the problem with NCAA stuff is just, you know, kind of rolled out a little haphazardly and not legislated properly. So while the idea is you're not, it's not actually a pay for play thing, you know, in reality, it, it pretty much is. And there's definitely bidding wars that go on. And, you know, I do think a lot of numbers in talking to coaches, a lot of numbers are inflated. But there's definitely, you know, a quarterback is there quarterbacks out there that are definitely making, you know, like a million dollars or some of those big numbers, which is crazy. But I guess that the market is setting that kind of price and they're taking advantage of it. Um, I think it's cool when there's uh, partnerships like in college towns between players and a local business. Like that's kind of a neat way to bring people together and for there to be compensation for, you know, some, some endorsement work. Uh, like for example, loved when there was uh there was a, what was it? There was someone on Kentucky football who had, what was their name? It was something that was like, it wasn't that his name was air conditioner, but it was the, oh, the coldest, the coldest was his name. So he had a deal <laughs> with the, uh, an HVAC company in town. Like, you know, that stuff's For fun. Sure. Um, yeah. So it bottom line is, I like it. I think it's good. I think it's fair for athletes to share. But yes, I would like to see legislation so it's reined in. So you got you got a, uh, many more questions here. Some really good ones. Um, so I always like to make things personal when I ask the questions. So first of all, I'm a general manager of the Harvard Group, which is a college bookstore. So I thought that was a funny comment that you made. Um, I also happen to uh, be a big Patriots fan, and we're probably the not the worst team in football we're, we're competing to be. Um, okay. And your question is, why does a team like the White Sox become so bad? <laughs> is it the manager? Is it the general uh, manager? Is it the owner? Is it something else? And so you could translate that question to us up here and many other places, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a little bit of everything, but I do think that it starts at the very top. And I don't know how many Chicagoans are on here. You have a White lot. Sox fans you have a, are on you, here. You have, a good, you have a very strong delegation. Right? My guess is I would not get any argument about that. I think, you know, ultimately for the White Sox, Jerry Reinsdorf has made it hard for them to win. And I think that you know, his deep loyalty to people, his unwillingness to spend money to acquire players in a way that matches up with this market size. Um, I think his stubbornness in the way of, you know, for example, when, and I'm not saying that Chris Getz, their current general manager, won't be good or isn't good I don't think we know yet but when Jerry Reinsdorf you know finally decided to fire the previous GM Rick Hahn and the VP of baseball Kenny Williams who'd been there for a long time um, you know he didn't even do interviews outside of the organization to see what else is out there or to get ideas for you know, maybe there's some things I think anyone when they're doing something in one place for a long time, you know, gets blind spots and has ways that, that they can learn by talking with others. He, he just kind of stubbornly stood up there and said, well, why would we need to interview anyone outside of the organization when we know we've got the right guy in the organization? Because Chris Getz was working in the organization. So yeah, I just think that uh, an unwillingness to to um, evolve 
as as the game has evolved and spending has evolved. And I think, um, you know, and maybe being too patient with certain people in certain jobs has cost them. And I mean, a lot of things have to go wrong for last season to happen for you to be the worst team in modern baseball history. But, you know, ultimately they had a manager that it didn't seem like was qualified and prepared for the job. And they just didn't have a lot of major league talent. And I think that that was a really bad combination. It, it was to the extent of worst in modern history. And, you know, now today the reports that they're going to hire Will Venable, uh, who has never managed, but that's not unusual these days. There's plenty of, uh, whether it's a head coach in basketball or a manager in baseball, there's definitely plenty of people who, you know, ascend to that top coaching job without ever holding the job, you know, in the minors or in college, kind of the way it used to be. Um, but they're certainly betting on uh, the people he's learned under. He's learned, he's worked for uh, Joe Madden and Alex Cora and Bruce Bochy over the last decade. So those those three managers have all led teams to World Series championships. So they're banking on that. But, um, you know, ultimately, if you're going to operate like, like a smaller market, kind of like the Rays or the A's, those are kind of the teams that have operated that way and found success. Um, you got to you got to have people in your front office who are finding edges on the margins and, you know, like the money ball stuff that was so big for the A's in, in the early two thousands and your, your farm systems have to continually be developing, you know, all-star talent. And um, I know the Sox do have a much improved farm system with some really good prospects, but, I think ultimately they're going to they're going to have to spend some money if they want any sort of rebuild to happen at a pace faster than like four or five years. Any related question to that? What's your opinion of Grady Sizemore? I don't have a big opinion because I never got to do anything more with him than stick a microphone in a group interview. He seemed way more in touch with the clubhouse than Pedro Grafal was. And I was impressed by the fact that, and I, I get that, you know, all of them were motivated by trying to avoid um, losing 121 times, but they ended up winning six of seven to finish the season and, and legitimately threatened, you know, not, uh, not to overtaking the Mets. So, I was impressed by that. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's the type of guy who gets another shot at some point. Excellent. So um, some excellent questions. Um, who do you emulate as a broadcaster? Is there anyone that, that you uh, look up to or kind of aspire to be like or you know, role model? Yeah, great question. I think that one of the most important things is to be yourself and the danger of trying to emulate is, you know, trying to be someone you're not, uh, because ultimately you're going to be your best when you're yourself. That's going to be your most natural. That's going to be your most authentic. Uh, but if there's one person that I really look looked up to for any Chicagoans, was Mark Greco, um, and I had the chance to intern for him when I was in college. So for those, for Chicagoans, they know, for non-Chicagoans, you're talking about a guy who, you know, really was the best at his craft in terms of being a local sports anchor for, you know, 40 years. Um, and, uh, you know, he was the kind of person that you wanted to tune in to watch, to hear what he said and some of the funny things that that he would show and say so i always always really 
appreciated his style and appreciated that when I got the chance to know him, he was a, an asset and an advocate for me. And I could always email or text or call and he would, you know, answer or critique a story or my resume tape. And I was always really grateful for that. And another question is play-by-play. Uh, play. Play. Are you interested in doing that? Have you ever done it? Would you like to do it? And for which which team? Obviously Chicago, but which team? I, I mean, I mean, I would love to do it, but I really, I don't think I'm qualified because I don't have any experience, and that is something that's you know very different from what I do. So, you hmm. know, you see most play by play folks similar to the way that I traveled a road going, you know, from a small to a mid medium to a bigger market before I was in Chicago. That's what most play-by-play -play folks are doing too. You know, they're like, they're in the middle of nowhere ca calling, you know, rookie ball. Um, so I have so much respect for all those, those men and women who have big high profile play-by-play -play jobs that, they wanted it so bad. It was a hard goal. They chased it. Um, I would I would love if someone told me, hey, we're going to give you a chance to do it. Um, and I had some time, you know, I, I, I would like to try it. I, I think it's it's really cool. So uh, one question that is kind of different than all the others that I kind of waited to the end. Do you have a Jewish name? You're Jewish. Have you ever, are you experiencing any anti-Semitism? Have you heard any comments about what's going on in Israel and Gaza, about what's going on on the campuses just in general, or is it a non-issue for you? Well, yes, I'm Jewish. Yes, I have a Jewish name, Menachem Mendel, named after <laughs> my great-grandfather, my, uh, my grandma's dad. So that's special. Um, I feel like I haven't, no, no, I don't think that there's been anything that has stood out to me as being anti-Semitic, whether it's in comments or you know, on Facebook or Twitter or, or something like that, or I don't know, at a game, someone saying something to me no, I have not had that, any of those experiences, thankfully. Well, that's good to hear. So, all right. So that is the questions. We put you through the ringer. Thank you so much for your time. You have a lot of uh, guys on here that are not from Chicago. So we learned a little bit about that market. And everyone expects me to say this. So I'm about to say it. We have an international convention every two years. And guess where it's going to be this coming year? Chicago. How'd you guess? I don't know. I just had a feeling. And our chair is actually on the call, Mark Ivers. So um, maybe we'll see you there. It's during the 4th of July, first week in July. It's at the Sheridan Grand. We're going to a Cubs game. So it's all good stuff. So many of us have been well, to Chicago a lot of times. So... Well, guess what? The Sheridan Grand, I could hit a nine iron. Well, maybe I need a six iron from uh, <laughs> where I where I am now to the Sheridan Grand. So uh, that would be wonderful. Let's work. And I know it's unfortunately it's race week here in Chicago. The Chicago we, Street we heard, Race. We heard something about that, but we know how to so deal with uh, adversity you, in Chicago. Yeah, I, I, oh, I have no doubt about that. I'm more worried about uh, how many hours I'm going to have to stand on on the side of the track. But uh, let's let's work on it. That would be wonderful. Great. Thank you. All right, David, wrap it yeah. up. Wrap it up. OK, first, I'd like to thank Danny Mando, my co-chairman, uh, Steve Westman, who contacted Mike. I want to thank my IT mavens, Rick Ronsberg and, and Stan Greenspan. And I want to thank you for joining us for the program this evening. And, and of course, I want to uh, thank our guest, Mike Berman, who was absolutely fantastic. I learned a lot about Chicago sports because I know very little about it. It was very enlightening, very enjoyable. Um, I had a wonderful time listening to Mike. Um, I want to thank everybody and hope to see you at our next program. And 
That's all I have. Thank you and good night. And let me and can I say real quick? Sure. If anyone wants to has a question that they think of later or didn't get in, please send me an email. Um, be happy to answer it and talk there. And if Dave, if you want to share my sure. uh my um I'll give yeah. you my my uh, work email that you could share. That'd be great. Okay. I have it. Okay. Terrific. I can do that. Thank you, everyone. So, Honored to have spoken. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. So, Mike. Go on. Yes. Most important question today, Lou Malnati's or Giordano? <laughs> I'm I'm a big Lou's guy. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> that is I'm not, that is the most important question, by the way. If you didn't if you didn't understand the question, come to convention. <laughs> there, there you go. go. Yeah. That's great, Tom. Yeah, that was get great. Your answer there. Good, good that's time. why he's the past international president because he thinks of good questions like that. So that's what that's why I grew up in Chicago. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lesman. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Steve. Okay, Steve. no problem. Thank well, you. You know, Steve. Yes, Steve is my wife's uncle. <laughs> I knew he had a Yeah, he makes it happen. See, All I right, guys. The, uh, family up behind me here. Yeah. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thanks. Mike. Bye, bye. Thanks, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.